evening, everyone. My name is Eric Wright. I'm the Education Specialist for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out to our <laughs> movie discussion night. Um, before we get started, though, I'd just like to, to mention that uh, a quick thank you to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation for their continued support in all of our free virtual programming. And as well, I'd like to say uh, an extra special thank you to our sponsor, Generac Power Systems. Uh, so thank you to both of those organiza uh, organizations for their continued support. Um, without them, we would not be able to uh, do this virtual uh, platform that we have at the museum, not just here at Movie Discussion Night, but also our trivia nights, um, our drink and draw events, our book talks, our curator conversations. Um, we have a whole range of virtual events, and if you are interested in any of them, you can always find them at our website, wisvetsmuseum.com. Um, look under the events section and they'll come right up, and we'd have to be happy to have anybody join any of our events at any time. Uh, like I said, tonight we are here to uh, have our movie discussion night for the month of April. Uh, tonight, we are looking at the 1957 film, Men at War, uh, which was a, oh, here we have another person. Excellent, Brian. Um, we'll let Brian go ahead and get connected real quick. Good evening, Brian. How are you tonight? Doing fine. Thank you. How are you? Excellent. We're just getting started, so you've only missed my uh, introductions and my thank yous to our sponsors. Um, and like I said, uh, tonight we are looking at the 1957 film Men at War. Uh, and I just have to say what a neat little gem of a film this was. I may have not uh, had watched it um, any other, under any other circumstances, but um, you know, doing this movie night, uh, I think this was a happy little find. Uh, what did everybody else think? Just uh, just quickly overall, did they, did they like the film at all? Go ahead, Lisa. Lisa's got a thumbs up. Brian, how about you? Another thumbs up. Excellent. Uh, three for three, Franklin? Yeah, really good. Excellent. Good, good. Yeah, I'm glad everybody liked it. Um, so this movie was directed by Anthony Mann. Um, and there's a, he's, he's had a, a wide and varied career. I'm sure you'd recognize a lot of his work, but he was actually supposed to direct Spartacus. Um, and after the first few scenes that he filmed, Kirk Douglas realized that he was not the one for the job, um, let him go and brought in Stanley Kubrick to finish that movie off. Um, cinematographer for this film was Ernst, or Ernest Haller. Um, and he's got a, a lengthy film career as well. He did Maltese Falcon. Uh, Gone with the Wind, amongst other things, and one of my favorite Arrow Flynn films, Captain Blood. Uh, if you've never seen Captain Blood, I highly recommend it. I'm a huge Arrow Flynn fan. Uh, and this is based on the novel Day Without End by Van Van Prague. Uh, and this was originally supposed to be, this is a 1949 novel, and it's supposed, this, this uh, story was supposed to be um, about the Normandy invasion during World War II. Uh, so I'd be rather interested to go back and read the novel and see how they adapted it for the Korean War. Although I'm certain that, uh, you know, a, a unit getting lost after storming the beaches of Normandy and trying to make their way to a certain position um, is probably not too much of a stretch. I, I, I think that could be done. And something that we don't often mention when we're introducing the movies um, is talking about the score uh, and the composer. And I just want to bring up that the composer for this one was Elmer Bernstein. I thought I would bring that up because he is of note. He has done, I can't even begin to, to count how many films he's done. Uh, he's had a, a career that's probably just as big as Aldo Ray, um, who was also <coughs> starring in this film. Uh, but you, uh, some of the things that you might remember, Elmer Bernstein scoring uh, The Ten Commandments, The Great Escape, uh, and 1991's Cape Fear. And that's his serious side. He also had more of a comedic side. Um, and he scored Animal House, Airplane, Stripes, uh, Blues Brothers, and Trading Places. So uh, kind of a unique character, Elmer Bernstein is, as far as the movies that he selects to score. Uh, quite a range. Uh, this movie stars Robert Ryan, uh, who we will remember from The Dirty Dozen and The Longest Day. We've reviewed both of those films on our movie nights. Um, and also Battle of the Bulge. We have not reviewed that one yet. Uh, and just to throw this out there, that Robert Ryan was a, a Marine in World War II. He was a drill instructor at Camp Pendleton. Uh, and of course, this movie also stars Aldo <laughs> Ray. Uh, he had a nice, long 40-year film and television career. And he was also a World War II veteran. He was in the U.S. Navy and fought in Okinawa. Um, also stars Vic Morrow and L.Q. Jones. Uh, it was produced by Security Pictures, which I'm not familiar with. That was a new one on me. 
Um, but it was distributed by United Artists with a release date of January 26, 1957. Had a budget of $1 million, had a box office of $1.5 million. So that does not fall into our films that didn't make any money, uh, but just barely. Uh, it didn't make a whole lot of money. Um, but it still, it, it made a little bit for United Artists. Yes, I think you could um, So general impressions, first thoughts. Anybody want to open this up before we jump into questions? I'll go. Sure, Lisa. Um, I like movies that are more uh, realistic feeling, like uh, Bridge on the River Kwai was a little quirky for me. Um, so this one, I, I really enjoyed. And when you talked about the score, the only parts that, um, for example, the movie, what's the one where the um, Tom Hanks has the volleyball? Oh, um, uh, Castaway. Yeah, yes. I, I like that movie until like the, the end where he's like with the whale on the on the wall. I was like, are you kidding me? You just ruined the whole movie by this hokey thing at the end. Um, the the little musical scenes that he did in there when, when the guy was putting the, the flowers in his hat and it, it was like ding, 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 this little magical music like that. I didn't care for those parts. And there was another part where there was like a little ding, 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 bell sort of magical thing. But overall, I, I really, I really liked the movie. I liked the flow. I liked the characters. I liked the cinematography and the close-ups and oh all goodness. of that. So great movie. Very good. Brian, did you want to say something? You look like you were. Oh, I was just thinking, but since oh, you okay. called on me, um, <laughs> Like Lisa, I like the movie a lot. And the thing that really most got me was it was the realism. Mm. There were times when I felt like it was Vietnam. Okay. All right. And in well, that sense, and if I if I could just ask, you know, and certainly I don't press any veteran to go into anything they don't want to, but what why 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 did you why do you think that? What 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 were the similarities that you felt? Was it, the, was it the, the brotherhood that was going on within the platoon or? For sure, as well as the. Oh, that, yeah, the funny That heads. too. Let's yeah. face it, that happens. It, every, every time. Yeah. <laughs> but the isolation mm. and the feeling yeah. of being out there, cut off from your unit, on quote, patrol, mm. whatever the hell that means. <laughs> and, and why are we in this war? Why are we fighting this war? Who is the enemy? And of course, their quote, and forgive the expression, I'm using quotes, sure. gooks. Yeah. Remember the term gooks? Yeah, you always have to you always have to put your enemy into the category of the other. So you have exactly. to create these names for them, you know, that are whether they're derisive or not, they usually are. Uh, yeah. but yeah, you have to create these names for them so you can place them in a different category. It makes it easier for, for, for us to kill them, I guess. That's what exactly. And I thought the film did that. I don't know. What do you folks, the other folks, what do you think about that? Did it have a sense of, I don't know, realism and timelessness to it? it I, uh, I found it very moving. I'll shut up. <laughs> oh, no. we'll just take turns. How's that? We don't, we don't, have, to, we don't have to shut up. I, th I, I liked it a lot. Um, I, like the others have said, uh, the realism of it uh, really struck me. It, it, it had, it had, a, it was almost like you had, you had a photographer on the scene uh, of, of what was going on. Um, the, uh, the reference to the, to the gooks uh, struck me as well because I had not realized that that preceded Vietnam. <laughs> um, the, um, um, but it, but the, the use of a word like that is not just to uh, make somebody an other, it's to make somebody less than human. Um, yeah. And that's uh, what I thought was interesting was how um, how out of the picture the enemy was in this, except in a couple of scenes. Um, and and I was kind of struck too by the fact by what I perceived as not creating a um, a stereotypical um, uh, Asian Asian enemy. Um, I mean, the only time you saw the enemy, uh, you saw the Asians, the Koreans uh, sneaking up, 
but that's what you would expect from an enemy. You'd see whether it was a German or whether it was an Italian or whether it was a, a Korean or a Vietnamese. And they weren't doing it in a way that, that sort of um, made you think of them as something other than a soldier carrying out, carrying out the duty. Um, you also got that, uh, you also kind of got a, a mirror image. You have the, the Korean who falls out of the tree, uh, obviously terrified. Mm -hmm. And then you have the American soldier um, who's terrified and, and starts running away because of the mines and then gets blown up. Um, so I thought that there was, a, there was that parallelism and, and, but the realism of the thing. I felt like I was watching, um, uh, to a certain extent, an, uh, a slice of life in, in, the, in the lives of these soldiers um, in a way that I, I sort of, um, it was kind of ironic to see Vic Morrow in this because I was thinking, as I was watching this, I was thinking, this looks like a lot like a combat episode. <laughs> I, I, I'm a little too young for combat. I do. He was he was um, Night Stalker though too, right? Kolchak. If I'm not I'm, mistaken. I'm not sure it was Vic Morrow. Anyway. I, yeah, I, I don't remember combat though. That was that was just a bit a bit before my time. I should go back and look for some of the episodes. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I'm sure they're on YouTube. Yeah. Um, Chris, and it's interesting, and and Brian as well. You 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 both talk about the terms that they used. Um, for the North Koreans in this. Um, and I was kind of struck, and I mentioned it in my questions, uh, not by those terms, but uh, the term that's used right at the beginning of the film, Americanos, uh, Sergeant First Class Lewis uses that term. Um, oh, they're the, when, when uh, Montana and the Colonel are, are blazing through the field in the Jeep, he goes, oh, it's a couple of Americanos. And I'm just curious, I, I hadn't heard that term in a film that, you know, was set so early, uh, and, and by early I do mean, you know, maybe mid-Vietnam forward or anything, you know, before that. And so I was just curious if anybody else had picked up on that. And I did ask the question, you know, does this does this seem to strike us as presenting a more diverse military um, than we are typically used to seeing in World War II films? Because this is just right after World War II. Um, and, and I was just curious about everybody's thoughts on that. Well, the thing that struck me was um, because of the timing of the film, um, as you say, it was the, the novel was written in 1949. This was released in what, 1957? But the setting is supposed to be in the 1950 or 51, uh, that period. That was, a, that was only about three years after Truman ordered the desegregation of the military forces. And so it might have been a reflection of um, uh, at least the author's view of uh, that there was some difference in the way the, uh, the units were constructed in, in Korea than they were in, in World War II. I agree with Chris in, in a number of ways, Chris. Um, and if we look at the military at that time, we're looking at, I think that was purposeful. I, I don't even think, I know that was purposeful on the part of the screenwriter and director. And it is interesting that the only African-American in the unit was killed early in the film and he seemed to be a great guy and he was the guy that Vic, Vic Morrow's character and it was combat I'm old enough to remember combat great series I grew up with that yes um you look at that relationship between Vic Morrow's character and that gentleman whose name I forget I think his name was Edwards I think that was important why was the only African-American the one that wound up being sacrificed early? And what about his special relationship with his white brethren? And they were locked in deep. You know, that kind of deep friendship that you can only have, it seems, in war. Anyway. And not only that, um, Brian, but also I thought that the way that he was killed was very uncharacteristic for the, I mean, like you said, he, he, he died early on in the film, so they didn't have time to develop much of a character there for him, but the way that he was killed was so outside of his character. It was so foolhardy and so just um, useless almost, and he didn't portray himself to be that way up until that point, and I mean, quite honestly, it doesn't matter who you are, who's going to stop, you know, on a, on a foot march in enemy territory 
and just kind of lay down in the grass and put some flowers in your helmet and enjoy the sunshine for a few minutes. It's, that's, that's not very real, realistic at all. Uh, and I did look it up. His name is James Edwards. You were absolutely right. You had the last name right anyway. Yeah, I just, I thought that was so, so bizarre um, that, that they would do that to that character. And then, of course, you know, you're right. He's the only African-American character. He's the only character, it seems, of any diversity except for the North Koreans. The, um, the thing that struck me about uh, um, when it became clear that he was going to die, all I could think about was all the movies and the, and the actual trope, I think, in, in Hollywood that if you got a black guy in the movie, he's going to be one of the first people to die. Yeah. Um, and, and so he wasn't the first one in this movie, but, but he was pretty close to the beginning. And I, I, was, I was disappointed to see that that would have to be the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the way the scriptwriter wrote that. Yeah, I, I was as well. I wonder, folks, and forgive me if I forget, I only saw it just once, but wasn't Edward's character... He was bringing up the rear. He was put back. He wasn't even on point. Yeah. And so he was lurking back there, isolated. And it was a really interesting formation, them on patrol. And here's this African-American guy separate and away from the rest. And they put him in the rear, isolated. And of course, then he, then he gets off. I wonder if they're trying to make a point about that. What do you folks think? Yeah, the back of the bus. Yeah, that's what I got. Well, and not just that, but, you know, also, you know, maybe like, like Chris said, this was a time when integration, you know, legislation had been signed. It was starting to take place, but I'm sure it wasn't, you know, every, well, we're integrated now and everything is cool. I'm sure it wasn't like that at all. So maybe you're right, Brian. Maybe the director was trying to make that point, uh, you know, to say that, hey, even though we are making strides toward, you know, something better, uh, it still is not anywhere it needs to be. And, and maybe I could show it by this, this character's, you know, unique feature of being the first one killed and, and the way that he was killed. Well, and to, to play that point out a little bit farther, um, the movie supposedly takes place, or the, uh, the action supposedly takes place in the early 50s. Um, but the film having been made in 1957, that would have only been a couple of years after Brown versus Board of Education and all the and all the uh, upheaval that uh, developed out of that. Um, so that might it might have been a further commentary on that, subtly but uh, still there. And uh, you know, like you said, subtly, yes. Um, but I, I think it's important, and I'm glad Brian brought that up. I, I wanted to say that 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 whole like putting the daisies in he's back there and I, that was where I was getting hokey with the music and that, that I was like yeah why would he like I mean they're on this march together it's real serious and he's just dawdling around back there so I was glad that it came back out of that afterwards but I will say that I really liked how they did his death like um they had the guy sneaking up on him and then all of a sudden it's just his foot sticking out shaking tense and then it drops and then they pan the the weeds and there's nothing there and, wow. and it didn't like um chris said it didn't make them out to be like savages they were just doing typical enemy type stuff and so um i i really noticed that in that scene and appreciated it lisa and, and franklin i haven't heard from you yet but, but i wonder if that moment, and I realize it seemed maybe a little hokey, Lisa. I get what you're saying. That was a film way of doing things at that time. But I don't know. <laughs> From a lot of stuff that I've seen, I'm just wondering, do you, do you folks ever had the experience where even when there's a moment when you're not under fire, where you're just, part of you is longing to put those damn flowers in your hair or whatever the hell makes you feel like you're not there that you're somewhere where it's peaceful somewhere where you're not having people f shooting at you and that just makes me wonder if that was part of edward's character and it makes me wonder and i don't know what you folks think i'm asking whether that was part of what attracted he and vic morrow to become buddies their desire to be at peace rather than where they were. I don't know, what do you think? Maybe I'm just crazy. 
Well, it might have been one of those situations where um, by having been put at the back, by being isolated from the unit, it gave him the opportunity to think about that situation, mm -hmm. the situation he was in, and um, which led him to sit down, take it easy, easy. put the flowers in his hair. And um, uh, I think that was also seen, I think, as I recall that scene, he took his boots off, yeah. um, which was a really bizarre thing, I, I thought. Um, yeah. And at the end, they, they, uh, I thought when he went back, when they went back, you saw his boot on the ground or something like that outside off his foot. Um, so he was really disengaged from that, from everything that was going on around him at that point. And they were making a point with that, weren't they, Chris? Well, I think they pro were probably making a number of points, <laughs> um, but certainly, about, uh, certainly, I think I think your point about you know just wanting to to be in a different world from where you are, a different universe, um, and that was I think that scene kind of captured that attitude that a, that a, probably any I mean I was never in combat, so I don't know, even though I was in the service, um, but the um, I would think that every every soldier in combat at some point or other just kind of tosses his head back and says, geez, I wish I weren't here. <laughs> Did you want to join in on this conversation and you got something to add there? Are you talking to me? Okay. Um, I think, Chris, this, this really kind of lends itself to my next point um you know you, you and, and brian as well to bring up both of your points here you're talking about um you know when you're in combat when you're in these situations um you know, you, you kind of get to that point every once in a while where you just you want to feel normal again you want to you want to put all this stuff down you want to just feel like you're you know like we would say when i was in we were back on the block um you know with your buddies or whatever you see these characters right from the outset and, and somebody, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. And, and, well, I'm not going to be wrong because I'm not going to say for sure, but I don't recall seeing a movie prior to this that really dealt with the effects of PTSD the way this was done. Um, and it's, it's right from the very beginning. You see it not only in the Colonel, uh, but I'm interested, I saw it in quite a few other characters. I'm interested to see what other examples that other people saw as well. Maybe I, you know, they saw something that I missed. It happens quite regularly. But just the fact that it, it really dealt with that issue, um, not just in passing, but continuously throughout the film, I thought was very forward-looking. Um, and especially during this time, I don't even think PTSD was was even a term during this period. It was probably still called what it was called in World War One, which is just shell shock. Um, this is something that they can't describe, they can't explain, they can't, you know, really fix. Um, and, and, you know, not that we can fix it now, but we can certainly do a better job now than we could back then. And, and so that, I'm not, curious, long, long, short question long, what did everything, everybody think about the PTSD episodes or the character dynamics that we saw? Well, just an addendum to your, to your previous point about not knowing how to treat, it was actually denied. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was that was the bit, one of the biggest problems. I would agree. I think, among other things, this was a movie about PTSD. I Very much so. Yeah. And I don't know how you folks think. I really would like to hear from, from uh, how you other feel. Uh, While I was watching this film, I kept thinking of the work of Oliver Stone, who's mm -hmm. one of my faves, mm -hmm. fellow Vietnam vet. When I thought of Platoon and Born on the Fourth of July, mm -hmm. this film brought me to the characters in that film, like Tom Cruise and Fourth of July. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, Eric, I think you've got it. That is a big part of this film. And what is PTSD? Even though they didn't have a term for it at that time, they were all in shell shock. And if we had more of a glimpse of the North Koreans, or if they were Chinese, I, forget, I don't know who they were, mm -hmm. Would have been interesting to see what they were dealing with too. PTSD. I was very, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, was gonna, go ahead. I was just going to say, I was very glad to see them address this issue. My dad denied PTSD, shell shock, whatever you want to call it, his entire life. He, you know, he drank a little too much to co compensate. 
So whenever he had surgery and was coming out of anesthesia, he would hallucinate about the war. It was, it was sad because he could never get rid of that. And I think that's the common theme of a lot of these war movies and shell shock, PTSD, whatever you want to call it, is that it never goes away. It diminishes, but it's always with you. And I think that's the trauma of war is that you leave the scene, but the scene doesn't leave you. Exactly. You come home, but you're not really home. Parts of you are always back in that trench or battlefield or ship or wherever you are. So I was really glad to see this addressed. And what I also liked is each character displayed it differently. There's not a common way to display it. And that was before it's time. I like that part of it. Yeah, I mean, we saw, uh, you know, clearly the Colonel uh, who right. was mostly immobile, um, almost mute, um, you know, responseless. But then, you know, there, like you said, Sally, there was diff different, different degrees of it. You certainly right. see it in Robert Ryan. Um, right. His his more his comes across as more fatigue. Sometimes mm -hmm. he's a little confused, but for the most part, it just comes across as fatigue and irritability. Mm -hmm. um, one soldier I kept noticing throughout the whole film, and I don't think, ever think they put a name to him, but he constantly was itching. He was yeah. Oh, I didn't catch that. Every in it right, and he was almost in the very first scene before they even spoke any word. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Sergeant First Class Lewis was calling on the radio. Okay. Very quiet. Okay. And they're going through, and he's laying there on the ground, and he's itching his leg. And then you see him 20 minutes later, and he's itching his arm. And then he's Valid his point. Um, so, and then, and then obviously Vic Morrow's character as well, um, you know, he's, he's got some issues. Um, mm -hmm. He's struggling, and he has that great line. Um, James Edward says to him, well, you know, some people need help. And he goes, well, but why, why do I need help? Mm -hmm. what, what's wrong with me? And I just, I, I just, my heart broke when he's, you know, what's wrong with me? And it's like, you just, you know something's wrong, but you don't know what's wrong and you don't know how to fix it. Right. I thought, I also thought it was interesting that they chose the colonel to be uh, the suffering from the PTSD, which yes. which shows that it's it's not just the, the uh, lower ranks. Very good point. That we're, that we're dealing with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is a very good point, Chris. You're right, because usually when mm -hmm. we do see it, it is the privates or, you know, maybe the sergeants, but it's never the officers or at least the higher ranking officers. Yeah, um, it's, the, it's the veteran that went out and committed a crime, uh, the, right. that kind of thing. And he's, he's usually a, a sergeant or a corporal or something like that. Yeah. And I, I think that might even speak a little bit about to, uh, and look, I'm over here itching now. It's just, it's in my head. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, that, he, that might even speak a little bit about to his role uh, within his unit. Um, you know, if, if a colonel has PTSD that bad, if he's seen enough stuff and been through enough stuff to, to, to be that far off, um, you usually don't see that in a colonel. Colonels are in the rear. They're on the radio. They're not right up front with their troops. Um, this would suggest to me that he was right up front with his troops, which means he's leading from the front, which is, is, is a, a different leadership style and is normally portrayed and is normally quite honestly carried out in real life well kind of interesting too because i think i forget who the who the general was in world in in korea who was un, once asked why he was up in the front with his troops and his his response was you can't push a string <laughs> and and it's possible it, it's possible that um uh, that might have been an uh, an attitude that filtered down you know, to the to the uh, to the ranks and even the the senior senior officer ranks, that they were by the example of the of this general, for instance, they might have felt that they had to be out in the front too. And you look at the relationship that the character of Aldo Ray had with the colonel. I, I mean, that just tore my heart out. How often would you see a character like Aldo Ray's character have those feelings? for a colonel, for a superior officer. And at one point, he was right. most touched because apparently the colonel had called him son. And no one had ever called Aldo Ray's character son before. Yes. Wow. Right. Right. 
And, and, and I mean, you guys are leading me, you guys are segueing right into my questions perfectly. And I did ask, you know, up and, and, and I said at this point in the film, because I put the question out kind of maybe, you know, maybe a quarter, two thirds of the, or, or a third of the way through. And I asked, what, what do you think the relationship at this point is between the Colonel and Montana? After watching it a few different times, they never really explain the relationship to him. They never really give that backstory. At least, maybe I missed it. I don't, did I miss it? No. Okay, good. At least I was paying attention. <laughs> um, and, and I just, I know that, you know, it is kind of a, a, a directorial, uh, you know, trait sometimes to leave questions out there unanswered. Um, you, 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 can't, you can't just wrap everything up in a nice little package you know, in an hour and a half film um, and, and satisfy everybody. But I was just always wondering what that relationship was. I think it's clear, he makes it clear that he's not actually his son. But God, I sure did wonder for the longest time that that wasn't his dad. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I never thought that. I think it showed a lot about the character of both the Colonel and Montana. No, he was not his father, he was not his son. But in war, war, come on, folks, let's face it. I mean, what do you have there? Not only in war, they're out in the middle of friggin' nowhere. <laughs> All they have is each other. Right. And God knows what the situation was like when the colonel got his, quote, shell shock. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. Montana reaches in and takes care of him. Mm -hmm. What was the relationship like before that between them? And what was the mm -hmm. relationship like with the colonel and his men? And what horrors did they see? I think the film opens mm -hmm. up a whole lot of questions mm -hmm. about what that was like. So that, that term son, to me, implies a lot more than just a father-son. But Oh, interesting. I don't know. What do you think? I agree. Yeah, like I said, you know, I, I couldn't tell for the longest time when he when he does when he comes to that little mon that, that part of his monologue where he's you know is talking to the colonel and he says you're the only one who's ever called me son like that. It, it's clear from that point that okay they're they're not related, um, and, and maybe it became clear earlier. Uh, like I said, maybe I just missed it, but you're right, Brian. You know, just I, I can't imagine. I, I really would like to see what happened to them. I wish there was a, uh, like a part two of this film that was like a prequel. It showed everything that happened leading up to the beginning of this film. Um, because you're right, it just, it just brings up more questions than, than anything else. What did everybody think about, uh, just moving along through my questions here, um, more toward the end of the film, and I don't wanna, well, no, because we got plenty to talk about there. More toward the end of the film, um, after Montana guns down those three troops, they finally make it to Hill 465, and the troops pop up, and they're, you know, hey, 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 guys, hey, guys, and Montana just guns them down. And he turns out to be right. They were, you know, they were enemy in, in American uniforms. Uh, second time, well, at least the second big time Montana's right. The first time is when the North Korean soldier had the pistol in his hat, and he, you know, he was trying to surrender, and Montana wasn't falling for that, and he shot him dead, and sure enough, there was a pistol in his hat. But um, after he guns down the three North Korean troops on Hill 465, Robert Ryan looks at him. He says, God help us. It's going to take your kind to end this war. What did he mean by that? Certainly, and, and I guess I'll even add, was it a compliment or not? Maybe it's a realization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, you're absolutely right, and, and I, I could go into detail, but I kind of want to hear some other thoughts first before I start expounding at great length, as I'm wont to do. I think that um, I can't remember as a uh, Rasana or something like that, where he was telling the the lieutenant that he, I believe in you. You're going to think through everything, and so the the lieutenant was very, um, you know detailed and did use thought and whatever and he even used the word towards montana that he was reckless and so mm -hmm. it was kind of an opposition to the way that he worked things and um i don't think it was complimentary i i think it was he 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 didn't care for that um 
but I think he came to appreciate appreciate it and when they were on the hill later. Yeah, and, I just and, and saw. I, oh, go sorry, go ahead, Sally. No, go ahead. I, oh, I, 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 I talk so much. Please go right ahead. I was just going to say the first thing that came to my mind was he's the typical renegade, typical risk taker, just the macho man that not afraid to die. He just was out there doing his thing. What I found very peculiar was when they asked him, how did he know these people were Korean? He said the smell. Yeah. Yeah. Now that, now that you mentioned it, I had forgot about that line, but you're right. And I had a neighbor that was in the, not Middle East, in Asia, in a you know military situation, and he said they did have a smell because of the I don't I don't know the word he used this weird food they eat they make and eat that gave them a different you know their body sweat was a different odor. Hmm. I, didn't I don't know it, if it's true. I didn't take it directly as um, a smell. Um, okay. So I, I kind of felt like um, Montana had kind of animal instincts that he- oh, like a sixth sense, okay. That he would, he really picked up on his training really well and hmm. um, he, he adapted well. I mean, he got that one Korean out of the tree at first and then, mm -hmm. and then the, the three guys and then there was the other one you mentioned. It was, just seemed like it was a feeling to him. I think he used okay. the word smell, but I think it was a feeling to him. All right. <laughs> Maybe the way that they were acting or whatever. And, and I think okay. he, that was the wording they used, but I think it meant more like feeling than. A okay, feeling. it meant more than. Lisa, than do you think that that might have been a way for Montana's character to distance himself from people so he could kill them? Make them lesser so he could kill them because he was awfully good at killing. He really was. But he really separated himself from people. Brian, did so you see it when those um, Koreans were sneaking up on him that he was grinning? <laughs> he was. He was grinning. He was looking out of the corners of his eyes and he, he had, mm. to, had his hand up over his... He was grinning the whole time. I mean, he, he very much had some sort of like uh, animal instinct type... Hmm. Okay. He was able to pick up on things. Yeah. Yeah, he, he had set the trap in that scene. And, and when they took the bait, yeah, you're right, Lisa. He did have that sly little smile. Mm -hmm. Scarlett, did you yeah. have something to add? Yeah, yes, I do. Um, I've talked to a lot of veterans from many different wars, and they do talk about a distinctive order based on dietary factors. I, 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 and and I, I don't think that Sally was too far off from that. Um, I, I don't want to say that I've noticed it myself, but, you know, different cultures have different things around them, you know, whether it's their food or, or just what they use on a daily basis in their households. Um, and I'm sure Americans are the same way. Um, yeah. I'm sure that, you know, because we guzzle down cheeseburgers and Coke, I'm sure we give off maybe a different odor as well than, you know, somebody in Asia whose diet is more um, experience based. Um, so I, I wouldn't doubt it completely. Um, there's a bit of, there, to me, there was a, bit, a little bit too much distance for yeah, him to I was going to say, that there was a, a lot of distance there. And, I, and, and not, that, not that, you know, I, I'm not saying that there isn't, you know, those sorts of differences between cultures, but I think Lisa was maybe maybe just a little more accurate with her assessment that you know it was just this this animal instinct that he had. It seemed like every time that he did come across some sort of danger, he he, he was you know the, the hairs on his neck would stand up or, or whatever it is. He knew, um, and he knew not only that it was coming, but he also knew how to, how to counteract it. I thought that yeah, I, I agree with you. I think you got a good point there. A lot of the people that spoke to me were tunnel rats where they were in a very enclosed space. So I agree the distance is a factor. The other thing I wanted to say was, according to Wikipedia, this film is actually based on the same film that Combat was. 
who's based on the same what the, the same concept it's the same novel the same novel that yeah. combat was and the, the third thing i wanted to say when i teach classes the ones that seem to be the most realistic are the ones that largely take place outdoors if you saw them going to an office at the beginning and dial a dial phone that would ruin the <laughs> impact a little bit but in the, at the very beginning you would oh they're in a different time and place but when you only see people outdoors it's like you're there with them so rather than rather than starting how the movie originally started, maybe if they were in some quantum hut receiving orders to go yeah. to control. Yeah, yeah I, that's a cinematography trick. Yeah, I, I I would absolutely agree with that. I think uh, when you're talking okay. about movies like this, um, you know, there, there's no room for any indoor scenes. There's there's no. Yeah. You look at Saving Private Ryan. I mean, the most that they had of any sort of meeting was right there on the beaches underneath some camels some uh, uh, camouflage tarps but you're not going to have those sorts of facilities you know readily available you're not going to you know oh take a break time out I need to go wash my hands or whatever it's just not going to happen think about the african queen mm. oh yeah. Then again, i mean i've shown that in my classes and they they think it could have happened today because it's all outdoors and the other movie that this made me think of was uh, the one Humphrey Bogart was in where the cane mutiny. Oh, yeah. As I, as, oh, man. Oh, wow. I'm glad you brought that one up, Charlotte. I'm going to have to work that one into uh, our upcoming mix for next year because I had kind of forgotten about that. But that is really, that is a classic. Because in my opinion, that was one of the first acknowledgments of PTSD on film. We have to break that one down. Well, well spoke, Charlotte. Good job. Well, that's about the, all the wisdom I have, so I'll just listen. <laughs> in, light, in light of what Charlotte said about uh, the novel and its relationship, I, I feel like I kind of got, got it right saying that this reminded me of combat, <laughs> the combat series. Um, the, uh, had that feel. You guys just knew it. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing I want to say was that part of what I thought about um, um, uh, uh, Montana was that he was also that some of this his reaction there was also an, uh, an example of uh, PTSD uh, the way he the way he was responding to things and particularly in light of the fact that when uh, that the background to his arrival at that unit was based on everybody else in his unit having been wiped out um, I would imagine that that would <laughs> cause you to have a certain amount of PTSD that would lead you to the kind of uh, ac actions that he took you know, that's a really interesting point, Chris. I looked for sign, like I said, I watched this movie multiple times, uh, especially since it was free on YouTube. That was, that was even a, a bonus for me. Um, and I looked for signs of PTSD throughout all the other characters, but I never looked at Montana. I never looked at him in that, in that light. Have any of you folks seen the Oliver Stone film Platoon that I referenced earlier? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I realize some of you... If you well, when we talk about Montana, and if we had put him in an Oliver Stone film later, we would have found him in Platoon. Do you remember the terrible scenes, for any of you who haven't seen it, and this happened a lot in Nam, where we wiped out civilians and people who surrendered? What caused that? Otherwise, back home, what causes someone like you or I or any of you, male or female, to be decent human beings? And then we're sent off to war and we commit what the Russians are doing now to the Ukrainians, let's face it, and it's war crimes. We did it. That's what Platoon is partially about. And when I watched Monta the character of Montana, and that was done, of course, in 57, I kept thinking of Platoon. I kept thinking of the war crimes that we committed, the Russians are committing, and every army has committed. What causes those horrible things to happen? And I think we saw some of the inklings, maybe, in the character of Montana. What do you folks think? Well, I think I think that's probably right because if you think back to Vietnam, uh, an ancient uh, reference these days, um, uh, you have me lie, um, and me lie. A lot of that was a result of the uh, that, that unit having been in 
in close combat, having lost a lot of its members, and they happened around the little village, and it just kind of broke loose for them. Yeah. Brian, I would, I would answer your question with, I don't think there is an answer. I think a lot of different factors play into it. Um, you know, sometimes it's the frustration level. Sometimes it's being scared. Sometimes it's, <coughs> who knows what it is. Um, you know, I'm sorry to say that, uh, it, it, sort of, uh, when I was in Desert Storm, we named our tank War Crimes. Mm -hmm. It was written right there on the gun tube. And I actually had to stop my gunner um, from committing some. Uh, we had a bunch of Iraqis crest this hill and, you know, any white thing that they could find, they were waving like nobody's business. And my gunner locked the machine gun on them and he was getting ready to mow them all down. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, you, and he's not a bad guy, like you said. Um, you know, he's not an inhuman person. But when you're just wrapped up in these moments, uh, and particularly when you haven't slept for a few days, and you know you, people are shooting at you, and you have you know people are yelling at you over the radio, that you just you just kind of lose a sense of of maybe who you are, and you know I, I I'm not trying to justify any of it for sure, um, but you know it's it's I, I think it's a lot of different factors, and I think for many people, um, most people probably wouldn't have such reactions but there are those of us out there who just might have hit our point and it could have been anything i you know guy just took my last cigarette ah, you know or, or whatever but well to go back to me me lie for for example um the reason it wasn't worse than it was was because somebody from the outside the helicopter pilot came in and stood between the villagers and the and the soldiers um so uh, to a certain extent, you almost have to be on the outside in order to um, recognize what's going on in a situation like that. Yeah, and then, you know, and, and especially when you're talking about something like that, Chris, you also have, and, and I have this in my notes, you have the human <coughs> dynamic that's going on too. You know, if one person's doing it and it's encouraged by another person and it's encouraged by another person, you know, you start to get this group mentality, which just kind of sends you into, you know, a frenzy almost. Um, and, and so I could see how under those circumstances, it would, I don't want to say be easier to fall into that kind of trap. Uh, but I think maybe with just as an individual person, I think it would be much harder to, to cross that line. I'm not saying, you know, it, it hasn't happened and it's not going to happen. But I think if you if you have a group dynamic, it's just much, it, it's more, you're more susceptible, I would. Um, we are kind of getting down there in time, and I do want to talk about the, you know, the filmmaking process itself. Uh, I think we've got a, a few wonderful elements to talk about. Um, first of all, you all know that I am a big cinematography geek. I love how movies are shot, and I just thought that Ernest Holler did a fantastic job with this. Right from the outset, with those close-ups of Sergeant First Class Lewis, And in the back and forth, oh man, I was just, I was captured by those first two minutes of, of shooting. Um, and then as the film went on, well, I, I won't, I won't, I won't keep going into what I think, but, but what <laughs> kind of cinematography, what kind of cinematographic elements did, did everyone else out there see that they thought was really compelling and drew them into the movie? Well, for me, it was those close-ups. They were at shot, not just direct face on, but side angles, above angles, like laying on the ground angles. I, I really appreciated the, the close-up scenes and how I felt like I was kind of laying there with them. I think it was right before they got to finding the mines. Uh, he did a, a, a close-up of just uh, somebody's boots walking on the yeah, um, sand. Yeah. Uh, and yes, then, and then close up of the tires spinning in the in the sand too. I, think yes. it was, it, I didn't recall when it was, but right now thinking of it, it was it was like right before the mine, which is mm -hmm. kind of a tie in, right? Because he's zoning mm -hmm. in on the ground. Mm -hmm. And there was there was the close up of them gradually revealing the mine. Yes. Um, and and have, and and the and the the, uh, the the sergeant down there poking K 
carefully mm-hmm. in, the, in the close up of him doing that. Um, it, it, yeah, and you, so you get this sense of how contingent everything is mm-hmm. in a situation like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, if he hadn't tripped, he wouldn't have seen the mine. Correct. And then you you move through the whole thing. It, I, I think it's the, it's the luck of the draw in a sense that that comes through a lot of this movie. If if um, you know the, uh, the the soldier, if the black soldier had not been left behind, would he would he have died? Um, all these things that that uh, what if what if what if? Yeah, and that's one of the one of the notes that I had here, Chris, um, was just talking about you know the constant struggle between choices from the very beginning. They're, you're constantly posed with these choices left and right. What you choose to do determines how things are going to move forward. And of course, you know, life is like that. But just to just to, to be able to represent that so well in a film, I thought was was wonderful. So much so, you know, that I made a note about it. And I did put great screenwriting and great directing as well, along with the cinematography. You also mentioned, uh, you raised a question about uh, filming it in black and white. I thought that was extremely effective. I think this would have been a, uh, an almost terrible movie if it had been shot in color. I, I absolutely agree. Anybody else uh, enjoy the black and white aspect of it or, or not? Well, at that time, a lot of movies were shot in black and white. Right. We had a balance. So I agree with you, aesthetically, it works best, but it also fits into the time. It makes me wonder mm-hmm. if that film was made today, whether it would be done differently. I don't know. I bet. Lisa, did you uh, have yeah, something to say? I think, I think the black and white gives it a feeling of the past. Because mm-hmm. I always think of black and white photos immediately when you see them, you think of history. And then mm-hmm. also, um, it, it gives a, a kind of a, a solemnness to it, mm. too. Yeah, and, and, you know, we've seen black and white movies before. Sometimes they can pull it off. Sometimes they can't. Paz of Glory is a great example of a film that have, didn't have to be shot in black and white, but was. And it was highly effective, uh, just like this one. Others we've seen are in black and white because, you know, they had to. It was just shot so early in, but and not early in, you know, cinematographic history. But mm-hmm. it was just at a point where we hadn't really got to great technicolor um, advancements yet. Uh, but I thought, I, I, I'm a black and white movie guy. I'd much rather watch a black and white movie than a color movie, you know, for the most part, uh, mm-hmm. any day of the week. That's why I was really happy to see um, that um, Ernest Holler uh, directed Captain Blood. Like I said, that's one of my favorite Errol Flynn movies, and even The Adventures of Robin Hood with Errol Flynn, that's in color. But something about Captain Blood in black and white is just fantastic. Um, And then another thing I wanted to bring up about this movie, not just the black and white aspect of it, but just the overall tone and feel. Um, You know, like I said in this last, or this first question here under the filming, this came out as the same year as Bridge on the River Kwai, As a Glory, The Enemy Below, and Wings of Eagles. Um, oh. Those are all fantastic war movies, and they all came mm-hmm. out the same year as this one. And I'm mm-hmm. just, I really, when I saw that fact, I was really taken aback because this movie just really has a different tone and feel. It just seems like it's from another planet over, as opposed, and not right. that these other movies are bad, they're great movies, but this one just really had a different, for me anyway, a different feel. It just didn't seem like it came from that same year. Why didn't this movie get the hype that the these other ones that you listed did? I, I, I really I can't answer that, Sally. Like I said, the um, uh, the production company was Security Pictures, although it was released under United Artists. But maybe the fact that it was produced by such a um, small company, um, yeah, I you know, never heard that of had it. a lot to do with it. And I know as well that when the screenwriter and the director got together, the screenwriter submitted like a, something like 150 pages. Um, and when the director got a hold of it, he whittled it down to about 80 pages. And he took a lot of the dialogue out there. He wanted to see, he wanted to tell the story through, um, you know, motion and through visuals mm-hmm. rather than through dialogue. And the screenwriter said, well, you know, that's great. This, this, you have a, a fantastic vision, but you're not going to get any big name stars if there's no dialogue. 
And so they had to add the dialogue back in there to get Robert Ryan and Aldo Ray on board. Um, but aside from that, I don't know why this didn't receive the acclaim or even the attention to some of these other films. I, I, what, just, I don't know. Well, the thing that strikes me about the difference between, I mean, I haven't seen um, The Enemy Below or Wings of Eagles, but the difference between Br Bridge on the River Kwai and uh, uh, Paths of Glory on one hand and this on the other is that this is a very intimate film. The others are, are, are play out on a big stage. Um, and, and I think that, that makes, made, made a big difference here. It may have also been one of the reasons that it didn't get much, um, mm -hmm. much play. Okay. That people were, were looking for, for the, the, the grand movies as opposed to one that, that's as intimate as this one is. And I wonder how much the, dis the focus on PTSD, shell shock, whatever you want to call it, had people didn't want to know that existed. They didn't want to put that in their own reality that it's so, that people are so impacted by the war. They still don't want to know. No, yeah, That's it's, true. I was going to That's say the true. exact same thing, Brian, you're right. It's, it's, it's a sign of weakness. You know, it's it's oh, a that's, sign that's of, of having faults. Yeah, right. yeah, you're right. Absolutely. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of having faults. Um, you have people shoot at you a lot. <laughs> Things are going to happen inside. And, and, yeah. and not just inside, but everywhere. You know, uh, like I said, just that one guy, he just, he was itching. That's, you, you always saw him itching. It's, it affects mm -hmm. everybody differently. Um, My father... I was going to say, my father wasn't diagnosed with PTSD from World War II until I think it was like the mid 1980s. Good grief. Oh, sure. You're lucky he got diagnosed. Yeah. And it was only, be, it was only because at, at one point he passed out when he was driving to work. Um, and eventually was, uh, he, he actually had to, had to, he was on medical leave from his job for over a year. Um, mm. And wound up uh, eventually getting some, uh, going to a, a VA clinic, and it was just by accident, happenstance, that one of the psychiatrists there uh, was hearing a discussion with him and my mother and some uh, some other people, and she was listening, and she, the psychiatrist said, "This sounds a lot like PTSD," and that mm -hmm. led to further inquiry, and eventually he got a, a, a medical disability for PTSD from World War II. Wow, that's incredible. So that's 30 plus years, Chris, that he had to go suffering through this. Did he know? I, my, I believe, I don't think he knew. I think it was so buried so deep in his conscious, mm -hmm. uh, subconscious mm -hmm. that he, he, he didn't know it. But I think in retrospect, he was manifesting it mm -hmm. in his relations with other people mm -hmm. and uh, the way he... Mm -hmm the way we grew up in our family and so on. I, I mean, I never really mm -hmm. thought of it until um, I, I began visiting them again, my parents again mm -hmm. in, the, in the 1980s. Um, and that was when he was, he was getting his, um, in the 1990s, when he was getting his treatment. And mm -hmm. as I look back on it in retrospect, I think, I think it was there, but he didn't, he, he didn't recognize it. And, no, and nobody else did either. No. No. And I, before we get to my, and, and I, I just, I, we're running short on time, so I want to make sure I always get to my last and final question. But before <laughs> I do that, I did want to bring up a point that Charlotte had mentioned. Um, and it is a good point. Uh, she says that uh, she believes war crimes happen at every war on both sides because it is human nature and not because we descend into some non-human behavior. Basically what she's saying is it's, it's, it's in our nature you know, to maybe do despicable things in despicable times, perhaps. Um, I, I, I kind of want to agree with her. I hope that's not the case. I, I, I hope to be a little optimistic about humanity. I'm proven wrong almost on a daily basis just by reading the news. Um, you know, so she, she very well might, you know, hit a very raw nerve and a good point by saying that. Um, and, and that saddens me a little bit that just that's just the way we're wired perhaps hmm. not good and we seem oh, to be the only animals in the king, animal kingdom who kill their own mm. or at least do so for you know very trivial reasons um right right you know 
So uh, we'll end this on a, a little more positive note. Uh, who was everybody's favorite actor and why? Or favorite character, sorry. Not actor. Or actor, either way. And Sally, since you're on the big screen right now, we'll go with you. Oh my. <laughs> I have to say Montana. I, I just liked, I was drawn to him for some reason. I liked how the actor portrayed him and I liked how they wrote the character. Okay. Chris, you're next in the lineup. Um, I, I'd agree with Sally. I think Montana probably came across as the, as the character that I, I, I thought came, had the most interesting um, Yeah. Characteristics, um, right. and I, I particularly like the the way that he almost seemed to be in love with the cat with his colonel. Yes, um, yes. I there was like that. It. There was that that deep sense of affection, and he it it never left him throughout the whole movie. Right, Brian. How about you? Well, I certainly agree with the comments that were just made, but Robert Ryan is an excellent actor. And I thought that Robert Ryan, with the complexity and the ambivalence of his character, for me, grabbed me. They all did. Nehemiah Persoff, Vic Morrow, the Colonel, they all got me. I, I, I got into all of them. But Ryan's character was very conflicted. He was constantly, you know, pulling this and that. And I really got that. And he's, a, he's an actor of great subtlety. I guess there's the word. Um, also, by the way, Robert Ryan was a political activist and very active in the anti-war movement way back in the day. In fact, he was dragged before the House and American Activities Committee. Little side note. So I thought Robert Ryan, we haven't had a chance to talk about him tonight, but I thought he did a wonderful job with that very complex character. And if I could just, just add one more little note there, Brian. Also, the screenwriter, um, it is believed, it has not, they, they haven't found definite you know, proof yet, but it is believed that the screenwriter was a, uh, a ghostwriter um, mm -hmm. because the original screenwriter was also part of the, the Red Movement, the Red Scare during this time uh, that saw a lot of Hollywood figures be dragged in front of this committee, um, be blacklisted. Uh, and have to go through some very uh, extreme measures to even just make a paycheck in Hollywood. Um, and if in, if nobody's seen the movie Trumbo, I highly mm -hmm. recommend that. Such a good film. Uh, was the, was Dalton Trumbo the the actual screenwriter? Not for this, for this one? one, no. Yeah, he uh, was for, for Spartacus, he, I think. For, yeah, for Spartacus, yeah. exactly right. Uh, but that movie is just fantastic, and it shows what these these Hollywood figures, actors, writers, directors prop people, lighting, everybody. It shows what they had to go through during this period. So, yeah. Yeah, um, he, he wrote a great novel called Johnny Got His Gun. Oh, great film, too. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, favorite character? Um, I'm going to have to agree with Chris and Sally um, and on their points as well. Um, I really like Montana. He drew me in, like Sally said. It just, he, he pulled me in. It was, um, I liked his cleverness. I liked the banter he had with the lieutenant. I liked the, the comebacks he had. I liked the reverence that he had for the colonel. Um, he was very, uh, he, there was a lot of depth to him and I thought he, he played it, it all well. Franklin, you still there? Well, how about JK? Okay, I'll finish it up then. Um, Brian, I'm glad we're virtual right now, so that way you can't throw anything at me. I've never been a big Robert Ryan fan. Um, I, I've never, I've, and, and I think I think mostly it's because of the roles that he's had. Mm -hmm. This movie, if if I had seen, if this was my first introduction to Robert Ryan, I would probably have a completely different take on it. Because you're right, I thought he did a tremendous job in this movie. He was so diverse, um, showing all different sides of himself. As this lieutenant, I, I was really impressed. I, I was like, oh, and that was really one of the reasons I don't think I've seen this yet is because I'm just like, oh, Robert Ryan, okay. He's going to stand there with this short World War II jacket and his sunglasses. <laughs> not at all. That was not the case. He did a fantastic job. But I would have to go with the colonel. Um, and simply just mm. from an acting standpoint, 
that was a really tough role to harness and mm-hmm. portray the way he did, uh, especially with uh, Ernest Holler and those close-up scenes and his lips trembling and his mm-hmm. eyes moving in different, it's just, he just, I, I think as an actor, he really put himself into that role. Hardly a single word, a couple grunts. And I think maybe there was a word or two at the end, um, but you know, really no lines to speak of. It was all just uh, body acting and facial acting. And I just, I thought he did a great job. And he changed, he changed. He did, yeah. He, we, he, we saw him develop. Yeah, he started to come out of his 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 um, his malaise, uh, and you know, up until the point at the end, he he charged the hill. He was ready to go right out there and, and help out. Um, yeah, I just I just thought that that was a really neat role. Real quick, I just wanted to add this one thing is I know this was mentioned before, but Chris, I didn't mind at all that the posters were backwards. I Not loved a bit. them. Loved them. Loved Bring them, them back, loved Chris. Them. I, I miss them. Okay, I'll I'll see what I can do. Uh, backwards and all. <laughs> yeah, we 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 miss your posters, Chris. Um, and you get a you could start uh, this weekend, I, if I'm not mistaken. I think next month's movie is the Keeping Room. Um, and that is a, a a film that I'm not familiar with either. I think that was a suggestion from somebody, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I am looking forward uh, to, to watching it. I'll poke around this weekend and see if, uh, what platforms, if any, that it's on. And if I do find any um, platforms that are free or at least downloadable, I'll let everybody know. Uh, but next week or next month's movie is The Keeping Room from 2014, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe it's a Civil War film. Um, I could be totally wrong about all that. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I think... You. I think it might be available on uh, Amazon Prime if you're if you're a member of Amazon Prime. Oh, is I it? Got okay. Prime. You might take a look there. Okay. I, uh, the title I, I, again? I, Could you say the title again, please? The Keeping Room. The Keeping Room. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and like I said, I believe it's 2014. Uh, I'll send an email out uh, with more particulars over the weekend. Um, I know I promised that before and it failed miserably. Uh, but uh, I, I scouts honor. I got three. Is it three fingers? I was never a scout. I don't know. <laughs> You're right. Like that. <laughs> yeah, and I Eric, I have to say, this is the first time I ever got the discussion questions, and they were fabulous. Really I, I, know, me I focus. saw that email that you sent through, Sally, and I was like, I haven't done anything different. I don't know why you haven't gotten them in the past. But I, I know. Will keep, I will keep working the deal for you. I was happy. I was thrilled. I was glad to see you come back. I thought you'd given up on us. No, you will not believe this. I love the show Blacklist, and it's on at 7. So I start watching the dang thing and forget that I've signed up for a movie discussion. <laughs> now, today, my, I'm on the telephone, and my friend said, don't you have a mo- Zoom meeting at 7? Oh, yes, I do. So <laughs> thank God she reminded me. I, I set an alarm on my phone, but it still says blacklist instead of movies, back movie. So I hope to not miss any more. Well, we, we, we're, we're glad to have you back, Sally. And, and thanks so oh, much for- I, uh, I love having these discussions. Well, I'm glad you do. Um, I'm trying, like I said, I've, uh, I've, I've been trying for a couple of months. Chris, I still need to track down your avenue as well that you suggested. But I'm trying to grow this audience a little bit. I'm trying to, you know, if we could add maybe seven to 10 more people, I think I think it would be fantastic. Um, it's fantastic now, and you know, look, we're still we're over an hour now, and we could pr- probably go on for another hour. Um, so there's yeah. never there's never a lack of the conversation and and just a love of the movies. I was going to um, try to get my kids, one or either one of my kids, to participate, but they're in different time zones that make it difficult. Yeah, I've been trying to get my son oh. to participate. Now that he's back from Korea, he's just right down the street in Texas, uh, and they're just one hour behind. He hasn't done it yet. I haven't beat up my daughter about it yet because I know she's on her last week of college. Uh, so, you know, the past four years, she has a time for this. She's but too I've been trying hungry. To get my kids on well. <laughs> I've been trying to get some uh, friends to, uh, to sign into this too. So, I don't know. Well, we'll keep doing it as long as I keep getting a few people to show up. Uh, you know, it's, I'm just, I just love talking about movies. I love watching movies. I love, you know, that's my hobby. One of my big hobbies is films. And Chris I, and I haven't made the leaderboard yet for trivia, but all, of you, all, all of you all come out and play trivia. Oh, i got to remember to do A that. lot of learning. It's good fun. 
Chris won Ever? last last week, no. two weeks ago. Yeah. He, oh, he, his alias, what? he's he's answer is 42. What, Chris? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I don't know how it happened either. <laughs> <laughs> did you get my Eric, email, Eric? What's that? Eric, did is you it get possible? my email about that, Eric? I did, yeah. And I, uh, I, I was talking to the director of the foundation to see what they could do about that. It, it sounds like she's going to be fine. Uh, with just rolling that over for you. So. Oh, okay. I missed that, Chris. Sorry. I'll have to look for you. <laughs> and you have been on the leaderboard, Lisa. You've been up there. Hey, you've been on it. Right? Eric, is it possible to do a different evening? I think part of the problem is Friday nights are in Milwaukee anyway. It's fish fry and party night. So I just wondered if a weeknight <laughs> would be better. I think we'd have to move out of the whole Midwest entirely to avoid that, Sally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know, I know. But, but I just you know, wondered I, if maybe a Wednesday or Thursday or Tuesday or something. I don't know. I, I could definitely take a look at that and uh, and and see how that's going to play out. We, like I said, we have a lot of other virtual events that we do. Some oh, of them okay. are on weeknights, um, and then we have in-person um, after-hours events as well. Now that oh, we're sure. all back to work, so I'll see how that could play out. You know, you never know. Um, but Friday nights actually work out best for me, frankly. Yeah, but, they're not uh, a big deal and, and for me, me too. either. But I, you know, I'm 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 available. You know, I I work usually late for three or four nights a week. So, oh, either way, it doesn't know. matter for me. <laughs> okay. But anyway, I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend. Um, and yes, we thank will definitely you. See some of you at our upcoming events. Others we won't see until next month. I will start working on questions for that. Um, I'd like to get those out a lot sooner than I did these. I had a hard time with these questions this time. I, I didn't want to just ask softballs, and some of them were kind of softballs. Uh, but I, I really wanted to dig into the meat of this movie, and it just it just coming up with the the, the proper questions. I, I, I had a little difficulty this time. So, um, but and I'll try to get my backwards posters back. <laughs> nice. You do that, and I'll get the questions out early. Chris, deal. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. It was great discussion. Thank you. Yeah.